In today's unit, we will look at communication models, that is what they are, how many there are, and how they are classified. A communication model is simply an explanation of how a communication process works and what characteristics and components it involves. Communication models serve as tools in identifying, describing and explaining communication with the aim of enhancing the skills and abilities of people to communicate effectively or helping to overcome setbacks in communication. In other words, communication models explain how communication works and what can be used to pinpoint areas where communication problems arise. While there are many communication models, they all fall into just three classes, linear, interaction, and transaction. Let's begin with the linear models, precisely where the history of communication models started. Linear models are models that represent communication as a one-way process. Imagine playing bowling. You, as the bowler, are the sender. The ball is your message being transmitted and the pins at the end of the lane are your audience. If you aim well, the ball strikes the pins with a predictable effect. To strike well, you must also make sure there is nothing else on the lane that could deflect your ball. An example model here would be that of Shannon and Weaver, developed in 1949. Shannon and Weaver were engineers and introduced the following transmission model to assist in developing a mathematical theory of communication. Their model consisted of six elements. One, an information source, which produces a message. Two, a transmitter, which encodes the message into signals. Three, a channel, to which signals are adapted for transmission. Four, a receiver, which decodes or reconstructs the message from the signal. Five, a destination, where the message arrives. Six, the last element, noise. And this refers to any interference in the channel, which might lead to the signal being distorted, altered or made incomprehensible. Although very technical at its conception, the model has found its way into many other academic disciplines communication theory included. The model's simplicity, generality and quantifiability has turned it into a fundamental part of many communication theories developed subsequently. However, the model has been criticised as a huge oversimplification of human communication. In most cases, communication between people is not a one-way street. It involves simultaneous sending and receiving, active role changing between communicators, body language, etc. This model treats messages as pure objects and does not address the content or the meaning of those objects. It suggests that meaning is created by the sender alone, turning the conversation partner into a passive receiver of that predetermined meaning. Also, it ignores the fact that the meaning of the message often depends on the context in which it is said. Social, institutional, political, cultural or historical. Now imagine telling your boss you were burnt out and need a vacation. These days, most bosses would be happy to give you a break. But imagine saying that sentence in the 19th century workplace. In both cases, your message would reach your boss but have totally different implications, not only on the further conversation, but also on your future employment. Now let's move on to interaction models. Interaction models view communication as a two-way process that includes feedback from the receiver. Ping pong is a good analogy for interaction models. The sender puts the conversational ball in play and the receiver gets into position to receive. It takes more concentration and skill to receive because the one at the receiving end doesn't know where the ball is going. The ball might appear straightforward, yet have a deceptive spin. But by taking the ball and then spinning it back, the receiver might switch their role and become the sender. 
one of the most well-known interactionist models was developed by Paul Václavík. In his Five Axioms of Communication, Václavík suggests that human communication follows certain rules that most of us are not even aware of. The first axiom suggests that one cannot not communicate, meaning that we always communicate, even if we do not say anything. All behaviour, verbal and non-verbal, is communicative in nature. Action, inaction, silence, crying, laughing, shouting, all of it communicates something to others. This means that communication is not always deliberate and conscious. Every communication has two aspects, a content and a relationship aspect. The content aspect refers to what is being said. It is the information, the data of the message. The relationship aspect, on the other hand, implies how the sender wants the receiver to understand the information. This part is mostly delivered through tone of voice, word choice, facial expressions, body language, etc. Because a piece of information can be delivered in a number of ways, it is not the content of the message that is decisive for communication, but the relationship between the sender and the receiver. How they talk to each other determines the contents of the communication, and how something is said either makes or breaks communication. The nature of a relationship depends on how both parties punctuate the communication sequence. A communication sequence is a cause and effect sequence in our communication. A classic example is the wife who says that she complains because her husband always hangs out with his friends. And the husband says he hangs out with his friends because the wife is always complaining. Each party has a subjective perception of who's right and who's wrong and who started it. To Václavík, such discrepancies are the root cause of communication and relationship problems. Going round and round in circles can be avoided through meta-communication. That is, by talking about communication. By talking about cause and effect sequences. Human beings communicate both analogically and digitally. Ideas can be described either through analogies, any non-verbal means such as body language, gestures, signs, tone of voice, etc. While they offer almost an unlimited freedom of expression, they also allow many possible interpretations. Ideas are also expressed through words, such as by using writing and speech. Digital and analog means of communication do not exist side by side. Rather, they complement each other in every message. All communication is either symmetrical or complementary. This axiom refers to the status of the people in communication. A symmetrical interaction means both partners see each other as equals. In complementary communication, however, there is a quality of an inferior-superior relationship, a power difference, which often results from socially assigned roles. Think of communication between teachers and pupils, boss and employees, parents and children. Complementary communication does not imply that the status of the participants is forced upon them or that one party is better than the other. Finally, we have the last classification, the transaction models. Transaction models view the communication process as the sender and receiver transmitting their messages simultaneously. The game of charades is the best metaphor for transactional communication models. Just like charades, communication involves a constant two-way process of sending, receiving, adapting and altering verbal and non-verbal input to create meaning in our minds. Messages created in such a way are often congruent to some degree, yet still different because charades allows room for interpretation. A fine example of a transactional communication model is that of Schultz von Thun. 
he developed a model that represents human communication as a square. The four sides of the square are factual content, self-revelation, the appeal, and the relation, which can be further subdivided into the you message and the we message. Every time we speak, all four sides of the square are revealed and all sides are equally relevant. Saying, it's a beautiful day today, communicates not only the factual information about the weather, but also that one is in a good mood, that he or she views the listener as an equal, and finally, that the listener is invited to have a chat. For Schultz von Thun, communication does not necessarily have to contain factual information, such as words. A crying infant might not speak, but he still reveals that he is sad, that some boundaries were crossed, and that he needs to be comforted. Contrary to many other models of communication, Schultz von Thun does not see the listener in a passive role. To him, the hearer is an active participant responsible for their interpretations. When communication problems arise, they are only rarely related to the factual content and mostly stem from the other three aspects. Also, communication problems are not necessarily caused by the speaker alone. They often reside in the hearer's subjective interpretation, leading to an alternate reception of the message than what was intended by the speaker. Schultz von Thun suggests that hearers have five ears for the five different interpretations of messages. The first ear hears only the facts, while the second is for self-revelation. The third ear interprets the relation between the two parties, and the fourth listens to the appeal. Finally, the fifth hears and assumes what the speaker thinks of the listener. In practice, certain listeners are keen on hearing with only one or two ears while disregarding the others. Imagine your partner asks you whether you locked the door upon going out. Some listeners might interpret this message in a negative way. They think the speaker is distrusting and trying to diminish them. Meanwhile, other listeners might hear and see the situation in a positive light. They think the listener is simply seeking reassurance, for example. Ultimately, there is no real guarantee that the hearer will receive the message as intended by the speaker. <laughs>